Welcome back to the 2020 Kentucky Bourbon Festival, the virtual edition. I'm Steve Coombs. I'm your host for this and many other events. A couple of guys with me tonight here are going to talk about resurgent bourbon brands, some of the greatest stories in Kentucky's distilling history. To my far right, I have Brent Elliott, Master Distiller at Four Roses. And to my immediate right is Josh Hollyfield, Visitor Center Manager at Barton 1792 Distillery. Welcome, guys. Thanks for having us. Thanks, Steve. I need your best storytelling skills, which I know you <laughs> have. I've experienced it before, both as a visitor and a reporter. And we're going to talk about two fantastic brands that people look at now and think, man, they've been around forever. They've been great. We've always known them and loved them, but that hasn't always been the case with these uh, particular whiskeys or their um, iterations as the you know decades went by. You know, I'll, I'll be really interested to hear if Prohibition had an effect on either of those, but we love them now. We want to know why they are the way they are. So. Without further ado, you know, I mean, whiskey makers love to tout their long histories and these great stories. You know, some of it's marketing, some of it's lore, a lot of it's truth. But uh, not many distilleries have the stories that Barton's does and Four Roses does. So I'm going to start with Four Roses okay. and let you get into that, Brent, and tell me a little bit about where it came from, how it kind of slipped into the shadows and how it came back. Yeah, it's uh, we've had some very high highs and some low lows. You know, the brand's older than a lot of people realize because of our absence from the U.S. market for so long, but it really goes back to 1888 when we were trademarked. Um, our founder actually began in Atlanta, Georgia, and then he moved his company up to Louisville, where he continued selling whiskey under the Four Roses name. Scott's country for bourbon. That's right. So he, he made the wise decision to move up to Kentucky, up to Louisville, and that's when he trademarked the brand. It was in 1888, and then he continued selling Four Roses up to, and actually through Prohibition. So I guess in a sense, Prohibition helped us as a brand because we still had that recognition. We were one of six distilleries that was allowed to keep selling for medicinal purposes. So when Prohibition was repealed, at that point, all the distilleries, all the brands, all the labels that had existed prior to Prohibition had, you know, most of those were just forgotten. But because we were still there, we were still being sold, we were still recognized, we shortly became a top selling bourbon in the United States after that. No kidding. Yeah, so it really, I mean, as bad as Prohibition was, I guess if you look at it in that context, it really did help us as a brand. Because when we emerged, we were one of the few brands that were still out there on the market, you know, even though it was limited, you know, it was just medicinal purposes, but we were still there. How, how many uh, prescriptions were written for the I'd love to know medicine. that. I'd love to know. I have no idea, but I'm sure it's a, an astounding number. <laughs> I couldn't people. tell you what the ailments were, but yeah, I was out there healing people across the country for <laughs> all that entire dark period. <laughs> So when did the decline bit, uh, happen? Because you're talking about, I never knew it had emerged in Prohibition as one of the top uh, selling spirits. What, when did the downfall come? Um, well, after Prohibition, it started to climb steeply after that because of, um, well, a lot of it was due to Seagram's. Seagram's bought the brand in 43 <clears throat> and um, started to promote it. And it was doing great as a straight bourbon whiskey in the US. And then in the early 50s, they started to export to Europe and Japan. And in the late 50s, that's really when it took the downturn here in the U.S. because it was made export only, the straight bourbon whiskey. Now, they kept Four Roses, the whiskey in the United States because the brand was recognized, it had a lot of brand equity, but they put a Canadian-style blended whiskey in the bottle at that point. And so overseas, you can still get Four Roses bourbon, Japan and Europe, everywhere. So we started flourishing there. But here in the U.S., with the blended whiskey in the Four Roses bottle, over the years, the, the quality declined. The, um, and, and drinkers caught on to that. They did, yeah. yeah. It's, um, and at the time, I've, the reason for you know, that decision, I think a lot of it was the consumer's tastes were leaning more towards the lighter spirits, you know, the gins, the vodkas. And so you know, a blended whiskey is lighter than a full-bodied straight bourbon whiskey. So I think that was the idea, to kind of shift to meet the changing consumer demand and to stretch the inventory for inventory further because you know a blended whiskey doesn't need 100% straight bourbon whiskey right. it's just a proportion of it so that was the reasoning there but yeah ultimately it had a bad effect on our reputation um, and you know, our our presence in the US so when Kieran came around in 2002 and bought the brand that was really the turning point okay we're gonna pause right there because I okay. want to hear the cool part here <laughs> You got to hear the rough part here for Barton's first, which that's an historic brand way back in the 1800s, right? 
It did. We've been distilling here in Bardstown since 1879. And that, how many? Lots of names for lots this of names. distillery. So originally the distillery is sitting in our, our current location, or we call it a holler or small valley here in Bardstown, um, was the Willett and Frankie distillery. Uh, those that are familiar with the Willett brand, it's the same kind of branch of the family. There were two guys that were married into that family, Tom Moore and Ben Mattingly. They took over that distillery from the Willett family and started producing a bourbon called Mattingly and Moore. Somewhere in the business process, Ben Mattingly sold out to a larger company. Tom Moore stayed on for a little while, but wanting to strike out on his own, bought 115 acres in the same valley, operating off a natural spring, and opened up the Tom Moore Distillery in what is our physical current location now. Um, distilled up until Prohibition. Unfortunately, during Prohibition, unlike Four Roses, we were not able to continue to distill. We didn't receive a medicinal license. Uh, so all of our barrels were confiscated, um, but we were able to maintain the property as a cattle farm. So the family still owned the company, or owned the property. And then after Prohibition was repealed, we started making whiskey again under Tom Moore's son, Cornelius Moore. Um, the, the company was making whiskey for a while, and then, then came World War II. Uh, when that happened, a couple different things happened in the, in the whiskey market. First of all, the U.S. government encouraged folks to stop drinking whiskey because they felt we were using too much of the grains that would have gone towards livestock feed. Um, but then at the same time, the, same, the U.S. government needed us to distill high proof spirits for different efforts, um, industrial uses, as well as military uses. It's a story we like to tell, you know, you know, the term torpedo juice, you might hear an old sailor talk about high proof spirits as torpedo juice, uh, because there were sailors during World War II cracking open torpedoes and drinking the fuel out of them. <laughs> um, but you think about some good old boys in central Kentucky producing weapons grade alcohol in a wooden distillery at the time, you can imagine what happened. <laughs> I uh, managed to burn the Shouldn't place. Shouldn't laugh. I know the story. <laughs> I managed to burn the place down to the ground, um, but we sold government war bonds to rebuild the distillery three times its size into what is our current distillery building now. Uh, and I love it on the tour when you get to that point where you're standing outside, you can see brick, stone, and what's the other it's the a gold building brick, material? Like a gold brick. That are all parts of multiple distilleries, right? right? Yeah. And multiple layers of distilleries. So it's, it, it is a good talking point for our kind of our distillery, it's a way to trace the timeline just by the building elements, uh, which, is, which has been interesting. Um, over the years, uh, around that same time, there were a couple of businessmen from Chicago, Oscar Goetz and Lester Abelson, who owned a, 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 a they were liquor merchants in Chicago, but they needed a, a steady source of bourbon. So they formed a company called Barton Brands, um, ended up buying the distillery from uh, the, the Moore family. Then over the years, uh, through different purchases and acquisitions and whatnot, um, eventually became under Constellation Spirits. And then in 2009, Sazerac, a family-owned company out of New Orleans, uh, bought uh, Barton portfolio from Constellation Spirits. And we've been making whiskey under them ever since. But and I guess where the stories diverge a little bit also is Four Roses, be it blended or straight bourbon, was always making Four Roses, right? And, and the Barton plant did all sorts of stuff, right? Oh, absolutely. Yeah. So our namesake is Very Old Barton, which has been around since a long time, uh, uh, since uh, Oscar gets brought in that brand. Um, comes in four different proofs, 80, 86, 90, and 100 proofs. It's been around for a long time. So there's been different iterations through the years, um, but we also make a, a different labels there as well. Um, everything from 10 High and Kentucky Gentleman um, to 1792. Yeah. We can go back to what you're going to talk about, Brent, with uh, Kieran stepping in. Why did a huge Japanese brewery take a fancy to Four Roses? Mostly it was to retain the rights to distribute in Japan because they had a relationship with Seagram's. Um, they'd had that relationship for many years and um, they'd been distributing and it was you know, a brand they were proud of in Japan. It was one of the top selling bourbons in Japan. So when they saw that it was being sold, they want to make sure that you know, they still had the right to distribute that in Japan. That was really the motivator for the purchase. Uh, fortunately for us, when they came in to, to make that transaction, the first thing Jim Rutledge asked, you know, the master stiller prior to me, um, he asked if we could, or if they would be kind enough just to allow us to re-release that in Kentucky as a straight bourbon whiskey. And at the time they said, sure, you know, that was, this was 2002. This was, prior to the whiskey boom, um, there was really no strategic um, idea in mind when they agreed to that. It was really just an act of goodwill just to say, yeah. But Jim and that team and Al Young and those people just knew 
Oh yeah, I guess in their heart of hearts that, that it would take off if they let him do it. Exactly, they knew what a good product it was. They knew <clears> what you know what was coming off the still, what was coming out of the warehouses, and so they had total faith in the product. Um, so it just took um, Kieran to to believe in them and agree to that, and the timing was perfect because that was 2002. Then we slowly started producing for the U.S. market, and yeah, you know where it went from there. That was when did the blended whiskey go away immediately that was the last one once that once kieran came in that was the end of the blended whiskey and there were no tears shed not that i know of no <laughs> <laughs> we're, we're still living with that legacy it's, it's getting better now but that was really what we had to overcome for the first even when i started in 2005 i'd go out and do tastings and you know at these different charity events and i can't tell you how many people you know i, I got that look the people would look over, you know, we'd be in there with all the other bourbons and you knew it was going through their mind, you know, what's that doing here? Because that's what they were used to, that blended whiskey that wasn't, a, you know, it didn't deserve a place with, with straight bourbon whiskeys from Kentucky. What, what kind of a slog was that then to say, uh, to have Kieran's blessing to make straight bourbon for Kentucky, I mean, not Kentucky, well, it kind of was Kentucky for a while, wasn't it? Yeah. Then it started to uh -huh. I, how far down the road did, did Jim and his team have to look and say, well, we'll make it, but it's not going to be out there for a little while. I mean, years, I guess. Well, right? fortunately, because uh, the European and Japanese markets are so big, um, it really, we kind of inched into it. Like when I started in 05, we were still only in Kentucky. And that was just a few thousand cases. So because there was such a large quantity going to Japan, a lot of barrels still in the warehouses, we just take a little bit of that and reallocate that to Kentucky. So it's sort of a gradual process. Um, you know, at some point we started to see that the sales in the U.S. were really aggressive, and so we started producing more with the U.S. market in mind. But it was sort of a, a slow transition. Uh -huh. um, I say on one hand it was slow, but on the other, you know, each year it was 60, 70 percent growth. But those were on small volumes, and then we'd start adding new states. And so because it happened over the course of you know that initial growth, you know, five to ten years we were able to increase the distillery production and seamlessly kind of meet that demand. Because it wasn't running 24 seven at that time, was it? Uh, it was, it just wasn't running 10 okay. months of the year like we do now. We'd shut down the summer for four, five, six months because we didn't need that capacity. But it was about 2012, 2013, we realized that if we maintain that same growth we had to do something. So that's, sixty percent year over year. That's pretty solid. Yeah, <laughs> and every we'd, every year we'd say, "Oh well, yeah," but that's a small number. That's a small number. And then before we knew, it, it's like, "Oh, that's a bigger number." These are real numbers that we're growing sixty percent on top of. So that was kind of the the moment where we realized we had to do something, and that's when we started the whole expansion project. For those that expect the best, come see where the world's best bourbon is made at Barton seventeen ninety two Distillery. Located in the heart of the bourbon capital of the world, Bardstown, Kentucky. To plan a complimentary tour, visit 1792distillery.com. Isn't it great when things come together just right? Four Roses Small Batch brings together four of our 10 distinct bourbon recipes to achieve an award-winning bourbon with exceptional balance and a smoothness that's enjoyable neat on the rocks or is the foundation of a craft cocktail. Four Roses Small Batch, a perfectly balanced top shelf staple. Be mellow, be responsible. What about you guys? If I'm not, if, correct me if I'm wrong, that even though Barry O. Barton was always there, it was a great mainstay, that it really took off for Barton proper with the 1792 Ridgemont? Was that, was that kind of the pivot point for it, the brand? It did, but really it was after the Sazerac purchase. Because um, that, that was a Constellation effort, right? Right, yeah. right. So it came out under Constellation and, and it did okay. Um, and, you know, it got us out there a little bit, but it really, what we've seen 1792 take off, I'd say since 2015 is really when we've started to see that push. And that's when we did the rebrand. And then we started to, to release some other editions of 1792. What was this name by chance a deliberate effort to get away from? I mean, I, I still love Barton. It's a great whiskey. It's a great name. But I mean, that's a total departure. It was a wild variety. I even thought, wow, the two are the same thing. 
Is it a departure from? Family? Yeah, I mean, a totally different package, totally different name to, to kind of say this is the new and cool whiskey. It is, and uh, you know, Varial Barton is has been around for a long time, um, uh, and you know, putting that into perspective with the Sazerac acquisition, when Sazerac acquired the Barton portfolio, the plan for the distillery was to shut the distillery down. Oh wow! Um, so the the previous owners, when they were selling the, the portfolio to Sazerac, said. You know, you're making too much distillate over at Buffalo Trace, which is our sister property. So why don't you shut down the Barton property um, and start moving Buffalo Trace barrels out to Bardstown? Uh, you can make 17i2 at Buffalo Trace if you want, but just use the property. Um, and then we also was the Glenmore Distillery out of Owensboro, which was part of the Barton portfolio, as well as a shipping and receiving facility out in Carson, California. So the plan was to shut the distillery down, move all the bottling out to Glenmore, use the Barton property just as, as warehousing. So Sazerac said, okay, we'll do that. But then had the foresight that, that bourbon was, we we're gonna need more bourbon. So they opened the distillery back up and then, then put in a little bit more effort behind the 1792 brand. The 1792 brand had kind of gotten lost because we only had the one product, the yeah. 1792 Ridgemont Reserve. If you remember the same glass bottle, but with a burlap neck and a, the wood stopper. Um, so in 2015, we went through a, a pretty big brand change just drop the Ridgemont Reserve because there is no Ridgemont. It was, it was just a, a marketing thing. <laughs> no, in bourbon, go, go figure. There's no Mr. Ridgemont. We're not in Ridgemont, Kentucky. There's not, not even Mr. Barton though. for that matter. What's that? There's not even Mr. Barton for that. Yeah, matter. that's true. I mean, we, we really don't know where the Barton name came from. Oscar Goetz always said he picked it out of a hat. Um, of course, there's always stories within, within bourbon lore, but we, you know, whether it was a, lost the name to a, in a poker game or or to uh, name it after a dog. There's all these kind of legends, but Oscar always said he picked that up a hat. And there's one thing that I would love to add about the fact that Barton was set up to be mothballed. It's still the way it was. Oh yeah. I mean, there's some new fermenters and things like that, but it's still that beautiful old still and some really almost creepy looking uh, sci-fi movie controls on the still, right? Is that still well, a control panel there? There is a control panel. And I think what you're talking about is where our mash cookers are. Um, so you have this 19, it looks like out of um, almost like a, a missile silo, you know, yeah, the, the yeah. knobs and <laughs> dials and half the panel still works and the other half we've actually transitioned into a touch screen, but it's still- the But panel. go see it. Wow, yeah. it's still old. It's really <laughs> yeah. cool. Because I'm sure it's eventually it's going to change. It's going to yeah. last forever. Yeah. So it, it, I like to tell people when they take our tour for the first time, it's a mixture of new and old. So it, we've got, got a lot of processes that we still use from the 40s and 50s and 60s, and, but then you have to modernize a little bit here and there. I'll talk about, let's go back to when Four Roses was starting to take off. The first time that I, I was fairly new to bourbon at that point, and where I heard about it was from kind of the bourbon cognoscenti, people who really knew, who were there in the late 1990s watching it and pushing that growth. Uh -huh. And they were hot on Four Roses. Is, is, is that kind of where it happened, like kind of a grassroots thing? Absolutely, yeah. We had a core group, because initially, say 2005 when I started, there wasn't even a marketing department. We weren't consciously marketing it in any way. <laughs> But what we did have were consumers that, you know, it was almost like a, you know, a diehard group of people that would, I mean, there was a group that would come from Michigan every year at Bourbon Festival, and they'd be about half the guests, and they'd go up there and they were telling their friends about it. And you'd start to see more groups like that, people that were just, it's like they'd found something that no one else knew about. They, they were onto this, this wonderful bourbon that had a great history, great quality, you know, great story. And so that's really where it, started. it was grassroots. You know, people just loving the product and telling their friends and family about it, taking bottles back to their home states. Because at that time, you know, when I started, it was only in Kentucky. So you couldn't go. I actually was in Tennessee in 2005 before I came up and uh, started this job, and I couldn't get a bottle there to even taste it. So I came up to interview before I even tasted the stuff because I couldn't find it anywhere. <laughs> so you know, people would come and they'd load up their trunk, take it back. And that's really kind of how it started, that it sort of spread that way. I remember your coming out announcement of being the master stiller, Jim was leaving, and, and you were out pouring coffee in the line for people waiting for that bottle. And the very first guy in line was from Michigan. Remember that? He had driven I, I seven hours day. through the night and got there at 4.30 in the morning uh -huh. to be the first in line. So I, the Michigan contingency are strong. Yeah, thanks, Michigan. <laughs> yeah, that, that's great. <laughs> so uh, I think, too, uh, Part of the research of Four Roses uh, is on the personality of Jim and Al Young and, and oh. all those people who are 
more than happy to get up in front of anybody and talk about it. So the personality is a big player, right? Oh, absolutely. And those guys, they lived the history of it. You know, they were there through the dark years. They were there to help propel it into what it is now. And they love talking about it. So, yeah, that's part of it. And I think that's, again, it goes back to the relationship with the consumer. And I think we've always had that because everyone has a story to tell about it. We've seen it go from where it was just a short time ago to where it is now. And you can, anyone you talk to at the facility, you know, everyone's excited about it and they want to talk about it. So we're all very proud of it. Seems to be, correct me if I'm wrong, Josh, that where Barton and this whiskey has earned its chops is through awards and spirits competitions. Absolutely. Is it, that, so that's fair. Yes. Uh, I mean, this we, is not a big personality, no Barton guy. No. Um, you know, and we were already winning awards under the Ridgemont, but they were kind of pretty quiet. But when we started to really see big, big awards come were when we started to release our, our special expressions. Uh, we started out in 15, we uh, released a wheat version um, as well as the port finish. And then the next year we added the single barrel and then foolproof, which is really kind of kind of come into its own. So why, why do you think that? Because that, that one kind of leapfrogged all the others to really grab some headlines. Honestly, it's the purest version of our distillate or our, our, of our aged spirit because it's 125 proofs. So we take it down to what it enters the barrel at and it's the only one non-chill filtered. Um, so really that's, and what you're seeing is it, like it won uh, World's Best Whiskey last year for, for Jim Murray's Whiskey Bible and then the year before um, um, World's Best Bourbon from Whiskey Magazine, um, which are, are awards I think that we've all shared over the years. But um, I think it's, it's, I like to tell people that Barton is the biggest distillery in Bardstown that nobody knows about. <laughs> um, so it, they might know the 1792 name and the, the product that we put out, but where it comes from. You know, people are still learning about us as a distillery. So both companies now are in growth phases. You guys just double capacity. Mm -hmm. um, what kind of an adjustment has that been? Uh, that was kind of like you signed on knowing that that was going to happen, that you were going to be in charge of that. That's that, that, right that's when it started. Yeah. yeah. It's, it was, how it was, hard was that? Um, to double capacity in the same space. That, that was the challenge, yeah, to do it all on site, to keep everything exactly the way it was before. It was, yeah, a daunting task, but we knew that was the way we had to do it. Um, so yeah, just about anywhere you looked in that process, there was a challenge just to maintain the consistency and not you know, create any differences that would be perceived off the still. You know, that was our biggest fear is if we'd done something different and put all this time and money into this expansion and tempted fate too much by creating too many variables that you know, when we turn on the still you know, three, four years down the road after the construction began, that it would be different. There could be some difference. So we went to those extra lengths just to make sure that all those variables that could potentially be lurking to change the quality of the whiskey were pretty much mitigated. And we and you've had the luxury also of building a new bottling plant in Cox Creek, which is not far from Bardstown, if you don't know. So you had, you, you had the room to grow elsewhere. Yeah, we, so yeah, that was another project going on at the same time. And you know, also at that same facility, we're putting in new warehouses because all this extra whiskey coming out of the distillery in Lawrenceburg has to have a place to go. So yeah, everywhere you look, you know, both of our facilities, we're expanding, we're growing. And really, you know, I was talking about the different markets, you know, we've got US now, Europe and Japan. That extra capacity is really just for the US market. This is where we're seeing all the growth. Wow. Yeah, the other markets are healthy, and those are the ones we've been in since, like I mentioned, the early 50s. But the U.S. is where we're seeing that really aggressive, really exciting growth. That's got to be exciting. It is. Thing. So you guys are doing a lot of changes, but within the same space, too. I know your, your heating your heating capacity is changing from the coal, coal-fired mm -hmm. furnace, I guess. You've got new fermenters. you got a new distill. I mean, a visitor's experience coming online. What else is exciting that's going on that that's marks a growing pain sure uh, from a production standpoint um, last year or the year before we uh, built a 15 million dollar dry house um, to dry out the spent grains on the back end because that was a challenge kind of bogging up our process is getting the, the spent grains out which is cattle feed right spent grain right, right. And, and getting the you know the, the spent beer out of the way um, so we built that so that we were able to get it out the back end faster then we've added i believe four fermenters since then, they're all 50,000 gallons a piece, uh, which is going to increase production by 25%. Um, 
Um, in my realm, from the visitor standpoint, we're seeing uh, pre-COVID, of course, was exponential growth in visitors. Um, and so we are in the process of expanding our visitor operation into the old dry house. So when we built the new dry house, it was a complete separate building. The old dry house was in the distillery building, so we'll be moving in there, um, increasing our square footage in this first phase um, fourfold. So. That's going to be exciting for you since oh, you're in charge of all that, right? Yeah, absolutely. How large is the visitor centers now? Maybe, we're maybe about, 800 square feet? We're maybe? about 1,200 square feet currently. Um, and then uh, this will move us into just under 6,000 square feet. Oh and then we gosh. have room to grow with the same footprint on the next floor up, and then hopefully eventually a roof garden too. That would be super. Nice. So last question for both of you. What What's going to sustain this growth? I mean, you've got... New releases, is that, is that key to it or is it better brand awareness through marketing and visitors' experiences? And what, what's going to keep the momentum going for you guys at Barton? I think putting out a quality product and, and new experience or new products as well. Uh, we've got some stuff in the works, so stay tuned. Um, but you know, just maintaining the quality and getting more product out there. And then the visitors too, you know, our philosophy from visitors is we want folks to come visit us and then we'll push the brands um, and then hopefully they'll be able to buy it at home. And, and their estate tour is remarkable. Hopefully once we're past the whole virus thing, that that's the deep one, the deep dive yes. into the campus. Yes, two hour tour. It's so. a great one, yeah. Got to stay away from those three hour tours and all that one. <laughs> Anybody knows anything about Gilligan's <laughs> Island around here? Are we old enough, we're, we're betraying our age. Brent, what's going to maintain the momentum at Four Roses? Uh, I think it's probably the same as you know the industry. It's just the awareness, the bourbon trail, um, just getting people's attention. I think once people discover Kentucky Straight Bourbon Whiskey, you know, it's, it's not a fad. People, when they find it, they adhere to it, and they tell their friends about it. And I think that's part of our growth. That's why it's, it's something that you know, we've always known about here in Kentucky. But now the rest of the world and the country, you know, they're they're looking our way and discovering it. So I think, you know, that's just that momentum is going to be sustained. That's the products are only getting. We're offering more variety. We're offering better tours, a better visitors experience. So you know, whether from the the quality of the liquid itself, the variety, or what people can expect when they come to visit Kentucky, and that's all being elevated. So I think we're really kind of rising up to help meet those expectations and sustain that growth because it's it's an exciting time it's important for all of us you know all the distilleries here the state the individual distilleries so that's excellent news excellent news for viewers as well brent i appreciate you joining us josh thanks, the same thank you thanks for your distilleries and the way they support us everybody keep sitting with us keep sipping with us we've got so many more episodes to come here at the kentucky Bourbon Festival 2020 Virtual Edition.